Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Love never fails. Last week we talked about that. We're going to talk about love again today. And I'm going to put it into context of the spiritual laws flowchart. I just want to point out a couple quick things and I'll, then I'll start. We're saved by grace through faith. Galatians 2.20 clarifies that, that it's the faith of the Son of God you're saved by. It has nothing to do with your human faith. Humility is the doorway to the faith of the Son of God. It's actually the doorway to love. Humility is the doorway here. So grace, God's power, supernatural power, working in, in your heart to make you able to do any single thing that He's called you to. He's, he's, the grace puts the desire in your heart. Grace then provides the power within you to complete and seek the desire and actually receive the desire. It's always God. It's all God. All things good are from God. All things are God. The resurrection is all life and that comes from God. Hebrews 11.1 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So there's a connection between the faith of the Son of God and hope. That's established in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Substance actually, the actual translation of that word, it's the foundation of authority. So the faith of the Son of God is actually the foundation of authority that makes this thing possible. But when you come into uh, Psalm 62.5, if you break that down, you're going to find that hope is actually grounded in the positive expectation, that, that it requires positive expectations for this to actually come to fruition. And so although there is a link between the faith of the Son of God and hope, the link is actually through your positive expectations. Because this is not grounded in anything if there isn't anything here and there's no way for it to grow. There's no way. So your hope and your expectations have to be synced. Now that happens a lot of times where you might have a hope that is difficult to hope for and maybe this hope isn't uh, designed to come to pass in the next 30 days. So you might have to have an expectation of how that's going to come about over the next 30 days, what that's going to look like. So your expectation can differ from your hope. Your expectation can be, can, can be the first step to actually getting to your hope. We talk about a, a, a businessman has a plan to do a million dollars the first year. He doesn't have a plan to do a million dollars the first month. And he probably doesn't have a plan to do one-twelfth of that the first month. There's probably something significantly less. And then in the twelfth month, there's something significant percentage as he ramps up towards that goal. And so we've talked about this. I'm not really going to spend a lot of time here. Um, but this is really one of the major battlegrounds. There's two major battlegrounds that you're going to face in your walk with Christ. One is your expectations. This is where he's going to come to attack you. If he can discourage this, if he can stall this somehow, if he can delay this in happening, you're going to lower your expectation, thus giving God less to work with. So you're the one that's actually stopping or thwarting God. You're the one that, that you're limiting God with your expectations. However, there's something more important than expectation, and that's love. And so this... Is like an electrical connector that splices two wires together. One is hot coming from the street. The other is not hot going to the building. Without the connection, the building has no power. As soon as you place a connection, this thing is live, hot, and ready to go full bore. Okay? So this is a connection that is necessary for God's power to come over to the faith of the Son of God. So without love, there is nothing possible. So the reality is this is your limiting factor. You're going to find out in a few minutes that this is your identity. And so where is the devil going to attack you? He's limited. He's going to attack your identity because if he can move you off your identity, off your belief system, off your foundation of authority, then he can take the authority, use it to discourage the flow of power until these things fall to nothing, and now you're in a trap. 
and you're stuck there, saved, but you're stuck in a trap till somebody comes along and can rescue you out of that predicament. <coughs> Love is the most important issue, and we started talking about it last week, and we're going to continue talking about it today. Um, we're going to talk about it in the context of authority. We're going to talk about love in the context of your identity. And, and we're going to talk about it in the context of it is the only way to defeat the storm. Love is the essential ingredient in defeating and surviving the storm. Without love, you can't survive the storm. So... We're going to do that in 45 minutes or less, by the grace of God, because we got some really good enchiladas up there that we need to get to. Amen. We also have a uh, a wonderful opportunity. We don't know, we usually get these in this in this church as much as I would love to have. I don't ever want someone to get sick or injured. I really don't. But when there is a sickness or an injury present, hallelujah, there's an opportunity to demonstrate the resurrection the power of Jesus Christ, the favor of Jesus Christ. It's unmerited. There's an opportunity to display that this grace is real, this power is real. There's an opportunity to display that the gospel of Jesus Christ is real, and it's not contingent upon you being a perfect rock climber to receive it. Right? It's not contingent on our actions. It's contingent really only upon are we willing to let Jesus heal us. We, we are not perfect. Never will we be until we get to see His glory in face to face. Today, we look darkly through a mirror. That's like a, in the olden days, that scripture is referring to the old mirrors were made out of polished steel. So they were darkly. So we don't quite see perfectly yet, but when, when, when we are in His presence, we will be like Him perfectly in all ways, body, soul, spirit, and we'll see Him as He is perfectly. At that point, yeah, hallelujah, without effort, we'll be perfect. I have no idea what that means for you, Tyler. I'll see then someday what you look like perfect, but it's not about your perfection today that, that, that Jesus is after. What he's after, the truth is, your heart with humility so that he can show everybody else how much he loves not only you but everybody. And he, and he if I'm God, I crave an opportunity for you to have a testimony, something that will just come forth out of your mouth. Because the, your testimony coupled with the word of the Lamb is the very thing that destroys Satan. And God's arch enemy is Satan, it's not you. And he uses our testimony with the blood of the Lamb, evidence that the resurrection is real. That all the things that are said about Jesus are true and can be trusted. Um, he produces and he uses things like healings to prove this. Does he want you healed? Yeah, he wants you back rock climbing again. He thinks that's the most amazing thing. He doesn't want you suffering in a boot. And he doesn't want any of these things. But there's more at play here. He wants to confirm the authenticity of his son, the deity of his son, so that we can trust in him. And as we receive, then our testimony goes out. And I'm telling you right now, there is a spirit of unity in the land that is compelling the highways and the byways to hear the testimony and set appointments with people to be saved, delivered, and come into the fold. No other time in our lifetime have we ever seen a time like this. It, it, it is an incredible opportunity. It is a stunning opportunity, and we're at the threshold. It's already started. It's already ongoing. Um, the only thing that can stop it is us. And the only way that we can stop that is if we stop loving. And sometimes that occurs because we don't understand what love is. Sometimes we don't understand that that's our identity. Scripture says that, that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They just don't understand who I say I am, who I am, who, who, who that in turn means who they are. And if you don't know who you are, you're bound to stub your toe here and there. Because the enemy can then deceive you into thinking something else. If you, don't, if you don't know who you are, if you're not grounded in who you are, then the enemy can make a suggestion that you're actually something a little different. 
And you might take the bait that you're a little different because the world has told you that for the last 20 years because that's the way you've acted for the last 20 years. And what you don't understand is just a little bit of movement off of who you are is now something that isn't you. And it doesn't have power and authority to do anything. It's a trap, right? So, hmm, hallelujah. Father, I just yield to you. And I rest in you and I thank you for the beauty of the message that you've prepared, for all the hearts you've gathered here today, for the power and your majesty that is present here. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence. We 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 thank you that you're our teacher, boy, that you are our instructor and our guide, and that you are the author of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are order. And I thank you for bringing forth a word today that has a pattern to it that will minister to all the hearts that you've gathered here today that will be, that will create understanding and revelation and birth love within each heart today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, okay, so 1 Corinthians 13. Identity. Though I speak, I'm going to read a few verses and I'll backtrack because it's easy to miss the identity here. But I just want to read a few things about love and then I'll back up. So I'm at 1 Corinthians 13.1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, though I speak with the language of men, though I speak with the language of angels and have not love, I am become sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give up my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love envies not. Love does not vaunteth itself up. It is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. Does not seek his own or her own. And it is not easily provoked. And it thinks no evil. Love thinks no evil. That's a pretty tall bar. That's a pretty good measuring stick if you're in love or not, though. Though I speak with the language of men and angels and have not charity, I am become. As soon as love is removed, you've become something different. You are love. As Jesus is, so are you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. God is love. Jesus is love. You are love as He is, so are you. That is your identity. That means that you're patient. That means that you're kind. It means that you don't envy. It means that you don't exalt yourself. It means you're not all puffed up with pride. It means you doesn't, don't behave yourself unseemly. You don't seek your own. It means you're not easily provoked. And it means you think no evil. That's who you are. If you find yourself acting outside of that character, that's not who you are. And what does the enemy try to do? Tempt you to think evil. He tempts you and provokes you to evil, right? He puts somebody in front of you who challenges who you are. He's just challenging your identity. You said something and they come into disagreement with what you said. They're challenging your identity. He's challenging your very identity. He's challenging your nature of love. This is how Satan rolls. You are love. He knows your love. And he knows that if you have love, even if you don't have these things present, God can somehow get this to hear and make it work because God's not limited. The limiting factor here is love. That's who you are. He's got to flow through you to get to you. Right? And so all the enemy is going to try to do is to tempt you 
to step out of love because that's not who you are. And the moment you've done that, you've stepped out of authority. Instantaneously, there was authority and now there isn't authority. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for showing me that this has authority. And so, if I find myself not acting in love, okay, I don't just say, well, whatever. I don't let somebody tempt me into acting out of love. This is most often going to be tolerated by you, by loved ones. These are the people that you're going to step out of your identity with. You're going to be able to forgive the stranger. The person that you're going to tolerate this behavior within yourself is going to be to the people closest to you. This is where Satan is going to get you. He's going to separate you from the things that God has drawn to you because he wants to destroy the bonds of unity. So he's going to get you to believe it's okay to talk smack to your bride or your children. Or to just not be kind to your bride. When she starts to talk, you talk over her and say, hey, well, whatever. I got the answer to that before I heard you out completely. Well, you didn't have an answer to anything. That's vaulting yourself up. That's exalting yourself as the all-wise one. You're not patiently listening to the one closest to you, waiting for the Holy Spirit to provide the inspiration so that you can then speak if there's anything for you to say. Because there may not be anything for you to say because God not, may not need your thoughts or your words to minister to the person next to you. All He's going to want to do is have your love come through you. Identity is massive to me because I know that the authority that God has given me is, is beyond my human ability to comprehend how vast that we can destroy the enemy and, and how really, in totality, we can revive the entire globe out of one basement. We don't have to be big. It doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take all these things. All those things are wonderful as long as they don't lose this in the process. They've got to have love, right? But I know that just the power of one, Jesus Christ, was able to change the way that we record history until recently, secularism has taken over and after death is something that we don't want to talk about anymore or before Christ, whatever that, that is, whatever that word was that they had. Now they've changed both of those. It's not before Christ anymore. Well, no, it is before Christ. I'm sorry. Just because you've decided to change it for 2,000 years, everybody knew that this was before Christ. So this one individual who had an understanding of this one thing, remember, he's human. He's all God. Yes, Christ is all God. But Christ is all human. That's what makes it possible for you to do what he said you can do. Because he was like you, and as you are, as he is, so are you. He's all God right now, but... He, he rose from the dead as a man. As He is seated at the right hand of the Father, so are you seated at the right hand of the Father. All power, all authority has been given that man, given that God, given Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's exalted above all things. You're exalted above all things. So that power and authority, it has to get through a heart that has been submitted to love that is willing to receive God's love, willing to receive the mercy that He wants to give you. He's not holding your past against you. You're holding your past against you. He's not using your past to limit your future. That's what you do. That's not what He does. He's stoked about your past because He can use that and take you to some place that everybody says there's nothing on their resume that suggests they can do it. Which means it isn't them, it's God. He gets all the glory. So, if I have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Disorganized sound. No power, no authority. Now notice, in your own human strength, although I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing... 
Though I bestow all my gifts to feed the poor, though I have my body to be burned and have not charity or profit nothing. There's a lot of works that you can do outside of love. You can prophesy outside of love. You can move mountains, he says. So there's certain people that, how did they get to the top? Well, they removed every single obstacle. That was because they had human faith. They believed they could do it. But without love, God gives them 0.0 credit. No brownie points here. It has to include love, which means, therefore, it is merciful. And it means, therefore, it is understanding. Patience, the root word for patience, means to abide, and it means not to become another or different. So all he's talking about is love refuses to become another, and it refuses to be different. It just refuses, and when it steps out of character, it understands that it has done so. It knows that this thing isn't love. It's able to recognize that this isn't love, that this individual here said something or did something, or who knows what it was that provoked me, and it knows that this is a very unsafe place to be because suddenly all these beautiful promises in Psalms 91 no longer apply to me. Now, is God going to uphold you by the power of His right hand? Psalm 37, I assure you He will. But at some point, if you refuse to learn this lesson, and, and, and by learning it I mean when you recognize the fact that you've stepped out of love, you are willingly going to the Holy Spirit and you're saying, all right, here we are again. I took the bait. The same trap comes out of nowhere and I go right over here without thinking to you, without remaining in this position, without listening. Remember, how do you hear? That word akuo here actually is hearing in such a way that the Lord can birth faith in you to do the very thing He's called you to do. It's hearing with the ability that equips God to birth faith. It's hearing that births faith that makes it come alive, makes everything come alive in you. So if you're standing here, somebody tempts you and you step out, then you know what to do. You also know that you're not going to beat yourself up because you did it again. Because chances are, there's a trap buried within your heart that Satan's going to be able to spring on you a couple dozen times. It's not the fact that you took the bait that matters. Are you humble enough to accept responsibility when you take the bait? Are you willing to partner with the Holy Spirit? Are you in friendship with the Holy Spirit? Are you in communion with the Holy Spirit where, you, where you're going to humble yourself and say, I don't know why I keep saying these things to my wife. I don't know why I treat my girlfriend this way. I don't know why I treat my boyfriend this way. I don't know why I treat this one person that cares this way. Or I don't know why I always tend to respond to this behavior. And you may not know in the beginning what the behavior is, but because you do recognize that there's something going on here that's causing you to leave your true identity, you're going to seek revelation from the Holy Spirit and say, help me to see what this trap is. Show me what this thing is. And then if we need to get the heart healed, why, by gosh, you're the one that created me. You're the author of life. If I am love, then you need to make this thing capable of expressing it. And whatever that looks like, I wouldn't know, but whatever you need me to do, then hey, I'm here before you. I love you. But let's get the party started, right? And so it's not that you, you know what to do when you stand here. It's that you're humble enough to say, okay, I want to live here. This is a better place because I want the power and authority and I need the grace of God. The grace of God provides housing. It provides cars. It provides jobs. It's the very breath you take. It's, it's why we're able to destroy the devil no matter what he throws at us. Who would even care? He's defeated. The gates of hell will not prevail. They can't prevail. They have no mechanism to prevail. The love of God is why this young man back here is going to stand up and go, wow, that feels amazing, right? Just like that gal on Saturday stood up and was floored that her feet were healed. I know the love of God better than I knew a couple years ago. Better than I knew a couple years before that. So don't be discouraged if you keep stepping in the same trap. Just recognize the fact that you have and repent immediately. Because if you persist in there, 
God's going to say, you know, that's wrong, and you're going to override that signal, and you're going to go, whatever. That is hardening your heart to the word of God. That is softening your heart to the word of Satan. And it's not long before you'll find yourself in the bondages of addiction, or whatever your previous struggle was, it will own you once again. As a dog returns to its vomit, so shall you return to your former self of bondage. That's what occurs. That's what the Word says. So the only way to defeat this is to understand I have an identity. It is love. I didn't earn it. It's not about my worthiness. It's about a gift from God because He understands without this gift, you don't get that gift. Right? He knows who He made. He created you. He formed you in the womb. Before He formed you, He imagined you. He knows who you are. He knows what you were going to do. He knows you were going to go rogue. He still made you, which is evidence that He still loved you. You are love. You're His own. He came to His own. It's just that His own didn't recognize Him because they had hardened their heart to love. And they've hardened their heart to the ability to repent when they step out of it. This past week we were ministering in, in a house and, and a young man, and this is the trap that would always get me in the past. It'd catch me off guard. Young man who's still struggling, um, recently out of addiction, probably still messing around with addiction, and he's struggling. He doesn't want to be in the bondage he's in. And, but in, in that position, it'll be easy for a person to take offense. And he took offense. He took offense to the things that I was saying, and he rose up and he spoke a tremendous amount of confusion right away. And in the past, what I would do is I would chase the confusion around the room. Right? He'd say, well, well you just said this. And I didn't say any such thing. So I would address the first point of confusion. Instead of going back and saying, hang on a minute, we were talking about repentance, and I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to someone different. What is your problem with that? I would take the bait, and I'd take the first bait. Well, you said this, and I start to defending the very thing I didn't say. And as soon as you take that bait, confusion is going to throw another pill out there and say, but this, but this, but this. And next thing you know, you're running around the room trying to defend Satan is controlling the ball. And by that time, there is confusion in the room, and the very people you're trying to disciple are thoroughly confused. <laughs> and Satan owns your meeting and you because you've totally stepped out of authority and out of love, mercy, and forgiveness, and the whole thing is lost. And then you have to try to redeem that, which means you have to humble yourself in front of everybody, fall on the sword and say, oh, my gosh, okay, right, okay. And I would come home how many different times going, what is so wrong with me? Why can't I just see that trap? Shut my mouth. Not a single word. Right? Until so God says, this is what you said. That's who you were speaking to. Just ask him if he has a problem with that. Just stay within the parameters of what was occurring. Don't chase confusion. And so on, on, on Tuesday, I didn't take the bait. I didn't chase confusion. And... It turned out to be diffused. It diffused the pride, um, and, and the, everything got accomplished. And as we were riding home, the, some of the people who hadn't been ministering with me for a couple of years were like, that was like the most amazing ministry. You were so patient and, and so loving and kind. And I went over and I knocked on Rachel and I said, just ask her. She's been there before. <laughs> She's seen where it hasn't worked out quite like that. And we were laughing about an incident a couple of years ago where I took the bait. And it was terrible. Now, the thing about it is, the second you step over here, God is still going to defend you. Okay, you still have protection here. You are a child of God. He's not going to leave you hanging. But I'm telling you, you don't want to take this bait. You don't want to step in this trap because this does not bless your heart. This brings heartache. There's no joy when you take the bait. There's never any joy when you take the bait. There's never any joy when you step out of the identity. So it's this idea that love is an identity and it absolutely is your authority. And this was what made Jesus so incredibly special. Through the attacks, he was able to patiently listen and listen until God birthed some faith or birthed what was necessary or provided the word that he spoke. And as we, record, as we read what he spoke, we don't find a misstep every time. 
But there's many instances in here where the, where the enemy challenged his identity. His identity was challenged every day. Satan knew who he was. And, and so the same way that, that, that Satan is challenging your identity, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna challenge the identity of Christ as well. Or rather, that's the same trap. Okay. Love never fails. Verse 8. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Whether there are prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there are tongues, they shall cease. Whether, they, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Love never fails. The verb that's being used here means love never falls powerless. Love never falls from prosperity. Love never separates itself from the promises of salvation, both eternal and those promises of salvation which are on earth, which are healing whether it's from an accident where God then just comes in and immediately restores for that accident. We were up in the Crow Nation, a, a, an 83-year-old individual, Chuck Realbird, fell off his horse. His, his, his son came along and said, don't ride your horse in the powwow. Chuck Realbird raises colored ponies. These are the things that, that, that they use in their demonstration of the Battle of a Little, little Bighorn where they whoop Custer every single year again and again and again and again and again. It's a little bit like the South that celebrates the, 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 uh, the war against the North. They still celebrate that victory. And they gather people, they gather Indians from around, Native Americans from around. They dress them in battle form. They, they get people to dress up in, in uh, Union soldier uh, army outfits. And Chuck Realbird provides the ponies that the Indians ride in the battle that reenacts the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which is, which is their triumphant victory. Well, he's like telling his son, no way, Jose, I'm riding my painted pony with my regalia and my chief's uniform, and I'm going to do it. Well, he falls off the horse. He breaks his hip. We meet him with a broken hip. He's too proud about the broken hip. He won't even accept prayer for the broken hip. This will show you pride and how you can, you can, you can overcome that because he wants to dance in the powwow. He fell off his horse. He breaks his hip. We come across Chuck Realbird, and we and he's limping. Hey, can we pray for your hip? Not now. I got to go dance in the powwow. Oh, come on, let us pray for your hip. Listen, dude, come back later. I got to go dance in the powwow. And he's off limping his way to the powwow tent, and where they're going to do the big powwow. And it was at the end of the meeting, at the end of the powwow. It lasted a week, and we were there for the last three days of it. Uh, that we came back by his tent to take him up on his offer for prayer. And we find his whole family gathered together, big table with about 30 people. And they don't know who we are. And Chuck Realbird and Ramona, his wife, aren't among them. And it's all his family. And we said, well, we're, we're here to pray for your father, Chuck Realbird. And they're looking at us like, who are the desperados? And what, what? I, hey, we met your dad on Friday. He said, come back and pray for him. I just wanted to honor the request. I'm not here to bust, bust up a family gathering. We can walk away, no problem. No, he's in the hospital. Go, go. Yeah, he's in the hospital. And so we go into the hospital and, and he's laying there and the doctor comes in and, and, and the doctor says, I'm sorry, Chuck. We just got to meet Ramona and him. And it was Rachel who was doing the talking with Ramona, I believe, and getting to know Ramona. And she's just telling us the whole life story. And the doctor comes in and says, your hip is broken. Your hip is broken, Chuck. I'm sorry. The x-ray show it's broken and you can't walk on it again or we'll have to give you a total hip replacement otherwise. Tomorrow, if you don't move again, we can probably mend it with steel plates and some things. And so an operation, an invasive surgical operation. But, but they said, what, broken hip like four or five times, right? Broken, 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 broken. Okay, fine. And so after they get done, they walks out. I said, well, your hip's broken. <laughs> There's no question, right? The hip is broken. Chuck Real Bird was told not to get on his horse. I bet your mom said don't climb the rock at one point or another, right? Well, he got on the horse anyway. He didn't listen. He fell off the horse just like his son prophesied probably would happen. And, and then instead of listening to this, he probably goes and dances on it and causes it to get worse. And it's finally at the end of the powwow that he relinquishes because he's in so much pain. But the powwow's over. Okay, nothing more to do but go to the doctor. We'll go to the doctor after the powwow's over. And so it's not that this man deserved healing. right? He didn't deserve God's love. In fact, he'd done everything to thwart it. He even refused the hand of God that was offered to him on that Friday. But I said, well, it's up to you all if you want a miracle. I mean, that's just, it's available to you. It's totally available to you. Um, and I knew full well that I needed to see humility 
And if I saw humility, that was evidence of love and mercy. That's exactly what that was going to be. And if I saw that, then I saw this, then I knew that that could be present in me. And I knew if he wanted to have his hip healed and healed that Jesus to it, that it could happen. And that's exactly what happened. We laid hands on his hip. They said, give us a miracle. We do that. No great fancy words. Like in the name of Jesus, Baboom. It was just sort of like, God's not giving me anything to say, so I guess I'll just say, be healed in Jesus' name and walk away. The next day is when we get the news. They're totally stoked and excited because they try to operate on the hip and they realize with the new scans there's no break. There's no reason. Surgeons absolutely honked off at the people before, right? The surgeon comes in to do the surgery. He's going to put him into surgery. He's all ready to do the deal. And he reads the scans to get the fine-tuning of the procedure he's going to do. And there's no break on the hip that he's supposed to do the procedure on. So he comes in and he tells Chuck and Ramona, there's no break. I don't know what happened. The goofballs the night before don't even know how to read a scan. Clearly, they're a bunch of idiots because there is no break in the hip. And I'm not going to operate on a hip that isn't broken. So you need to get the heck go home, right? The point of that whole story was that there was no, no deserving nature there for the healing other than God said, I love you. You are love. I'm going to heal you. Chuck, if you don't even realize that you're love, I still made you and that's who you are. And my love will work within your bones. So love never fails. It's never powerless. It never falls from prosperity. And it never separates from the promises of salvation. The root verb means it never loses authority, pipto, to, be, to fall down or to be cast down from a state of prosperity. Love never loses authority. It's never in a position where it no longer has force. And it's never removed from power by death. As soon as you step from your identity of love, you've stepped into death. And it's death, the law of sin and death, that has removed you from power. There's a law of sin and death. Romans 7, Romans 8. Sin is really alive. Sin isn't an action of, of, of doing this thing. Sin, sin, it says, when the law came, sin revived. Sin, sin in it, of its nature, it, there's a life to sin. And there's a law of sin, the law of life. In Christ Jesus supersedes it so you have Christ's life within you but if you step over here you've now come into fellowship with the law of sin and death this here is the law of death and there is no authority in death Satan has all the authority at that point and you've been removed from power so when you step from this identity to this identity you have been removed from power. When you step out of love, over here, you've removed yourself from power. Well, that's just about as silly as it gets. I mean, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I ain't stupid. I want the power. Do you understand that, 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 that there's a carrot here to, to, to figure this puzzle of love out? There's a bona fide carrot of power here. There's a bona fide carrot of authority here. And I'm going to show you it's the very ingredient that will destroy the storm. I don't care what the storm is. I don't care. Do I want storms in my life? No. They're always a testimony. Every single one has been defeated. Since I gave the whole thing to Christ and since I started to understand these things, there hasn't been a storm that's come, about, come against me. There's been some that have tried to take my life. There's been some that tried to take the front of my body apart. I've had a number of different storms. Whatever. It's, it's not that it isn't real, but it isn't real. Do you understand? It has no authority over me. It has no power over me. Yes, it's making me wet at the moment. So what? This too shall pass. This too passes. And I always emerge victorious, which means I always have a testimony coupled to the Word of God, which means I do more damage after I get out of the storm than I did in or before. Satan always regrets having me in a storm because I understand that I'm not going to lose my authority. I'm not going to lose my power. And what God says, your faith will be purified. 
because you've learned to stand in your identity of love in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the landlord saying, hey, yo, you got to get out of my house. Sorry. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. That wasn't part of my plan. Right? I don't care what the storm is. Financial storm, relationship storm, somebody threatening to sue you storm. Satan is going to bring a big bluff and it's an attack on your identity, your authority, and your right, and your privilege to live in victory. And he's going to throw it at you, and it's going to have all kinds of a worldly attachment to it, big names, a law firm, whatever it is. What, and it, all he wants to do is Satan to get you to say, what if that's true? It says don't think on these things. These things aren't true. So you've got to find some place in the Word. Isaiah 41, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 is where I have most of you. This is a perfect place for this type of thing. It says, be not dismayed. You're going to count this as all glory. This is actually for your joy. This is actually the unique opportunity that you've been waiting for that is actually, in some instances, God compelling you into that circumstance because of your prayers, and He wants to shape this identity of love and, and refine you and purify you. Let patience have its perfect work. Let this identity have its perfect work so that you'll be entire, lacking nothing. Your faith, your faith becomes tried. It's refined in the fire. Some impurities come out and some, and it becomes more whole. It's identity. Faith of the Son of God is who you are. And He's removing anything that counteracts that, any type of human faith, anything that says that I can do it independent of God. I'll use my faith. So you're intermingling the faith of the Son of God and your human faith. You're still trying to do it in your strength, your own faith. God is going to put you in a storm so you can depend on Him only so that you can see His miraculous deliverance. And all of a sudden you're going to say, I don't need this. This this did this. And your faith will become more purified, which means you're ready for a bigger battle. It's, it's promotion time in the kingdom of heaven. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became identity, a man, I put away childish things. Right Beforehand, we were a child. We didn't understand the nature of love. We didn't think we were love. We didn't think we could receive love. We knew we didn't give love perfectly. We didn't, there's all kinds of things going on. When, when we become a person, when we say yes to Jesus Christ, and, and He enters into us, and, and, and we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues, we have His power flowing through us. You suddenly have a new nature. You have now power over sin. Sin beforehand had power over you. So even though you thought about trying to do the right thing, you wanted to love, you were incapable of producing love because your nature was that of a child of wrath and, and you didn't have power. Sin has real power. Romans 7, it has real power. Romans 5, it has power. It's alive and it is equipped to defeat you. Unless you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is now power, supernatural power over sin. So now the desire to not love rises up within you or the desire to do drugs again rises up within you or the desire to do the thing that was always holding you back rises up. The power of God rises up above it. And as this tries to rise up, this rises up. This rises up, this rises up and pushes it down. It's God. It isn't you anymore. But it's God in you that superabounds, grace superabounds, authority superabounds, His power superabounds, because it's a law. And it's a bigger law than this law. So this tries to exalt itself. Your old man tries to do it, and, in the, and, and God is saying no to it. And at the last minute, you acquiesce. And it gets easier and easier and easier as long as you recognize that it's Satan doing the tempting. He's trying to trap you. You have a different person. You're not a child anymore. You guys have, 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 have grown into adulthood. So let's, let's, let's wrap this up if we go to Matthew um, 7. And I'll show this real quick and we'll... Does this blessing you guys? Yes. All right. Yeah, we need to wrap it up real quick because um, we're running just a couple minutes long.
Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will make him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Therefore, whoever hears these words, these sayings of mine, love your neighbor, love yourself, you're worthy, you're accepted in the beloved. There's nothing lacking in you at all. Nothing is lacking in you. You don't have to wait for some miraculous thing. It's in you. All you got to do is step out and let God be God through you, through your imperfection. You just got to take a step of faith. You just have to try to trust God and be willing to do things imperfectly. He says, whoever hears these saying and does them, them I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew. Does that sound like a pretty nasty storm? And beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. The wise man here, the one who hears and does, the Lord says, whoever does my commands, this is the person who loves me. So we have this action of doing the love and we are now accredited as lovers of God. John 13, John 14. And he promises the reward. He that has my commandments, John 14, 21. He that has my commandments and keeps them. He is, he is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest to him. Will manifest. You act in love. God will manifest to you. Getting a fresh manifestation of who God says He is automatically produces a revelation of who He says you are, which automatically produces a revelation of what He says about your circumstance. And proof is the people that joined the Desperado six months ago. You're not the same people. You know who you are, and you know that you've changed, and you know that you've changed because there's been this continual revelation of who God says He is, which has produced a revelation of who God says you are, and it just has you walking in greater authority without even trying. It's God. But He flows through a pattern, and that pattern is love. The hardest time to, to, to stay in love is in the storm. The hardest time to stay in love is when you're tempted. Do not get down on yourself when you fall out of it and you take the bait. Don't. You can't. That's exactly what the, Satan's trying to do. Get you discouraged. Because it doesn't matter. Because all God wanted to show you at that moment was, I need to do some work in you. This just shows you that your warning light is on. Right? It came on your dashboard. Check engine. Check heart light just came on. Check your heart light just came on. And you go to the Holy Spirit... And you guard your heart with all diligence, right? You say, all right, Holy Spirit, you come in here and fix this thing. I don't want to do this action no more because it doesn't bring me eternal joy. It doesn't make me happy. This makes me happy. And you're going to find that the love of God is going to flow through you at a much bigger way. You're going to have a greater revelation of who God says you are. And right now, we got an army that's come together and we're going to destroy the gates of hell. I'm telling you, we're going to obliterate them, both in Pueblo... And, 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 and in Guffey, and I praise God for that. Hallelujah.